Greetings. We're making a lot of progress on our topic of how to confront evil in philosophy and history. Today, we're going to address what sounds like a very large topic, the topic of anti-Semitism in Germany and the Soviet Union. And of course, this is a topic which fills whole libraries. Um, it is one of the explanations, one of the reasons, one of the background circumstances of the murderous genocidal attack on the Jews, which occurred in Germany, Eastern Europe, in the Soviet Union. But my approach will be a little more uh, focused. Um, I would like to approach this problem through the writings of Vesley Grossman, whom you've heard of before, and the activities and eventual destruction of the Jewish anti-fascist committee in the Soviet Union. And we're looking at the JAC, as it's called, because of the light that it sheds on Soviet anti-Semitism, both during the war and then uh, during the Stalinist period after the war. So let's uh, remind ourselves of who Vasily Grossman was. He was a Ukrainian Jew born in 1905 in Berdichev in the Ukraine. His parents were professionals. His mother was a victim of Nazi murder and genocide in Berdichev in 1941 in scenes reminiscent of what we read about in, well, in many sources, but uh, in the ravine in particular. He received training in chemistry and engineering and began his working career in a coal mine as a chemist. But in the 1930s, he began writing fiction. In 1941, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, literally days after the German invasion, he volunteered for service in the Red Army but he was rejected for a history of illness. And he volunteered as a war journalist, war correspondent with Red Star, which was the largest and most influential uh, publication of the Red Army. He served four years on the front lines with the Red Army, including the Battle of Stalingrad, the, the major tank battle at Kursk. And he was present at the liberation of Kiev, um, the um, Bobby Yar, location and the seizure by the Red Army of Berlin. He was not a religious person and he had little religious training as a Jew, as a boy and as a young man. In fact, did not attribute very much importance to his Jewish heritage before the war, but he became one of the most eloquent voices in expressing the tragedy and, particu and the particularity of the Holocaust. He always thought about the mass murders of the Jews of Europe in terms of the very particular lives of the men and women, boys and girls, professionals and farmers whose lives were so cruelly and pointlessly shattered. He's often described as the most important Russian novelist of the 20th century, more important than Pasternak or Sholokhov. His books, Stalingrad and Life and Fate are masterpieces and they have a uh, particular history uh, themselves, which I won't go into today, but a very interesting history. But several remarkable features of Grossman's life and work include these. Uh, first, a truly remarkable ability to capture the complexity and horror of the scenes of war and murder that he witnessed as a war correspondent, but also as a traveler in Ukraine before the war. Second, a powerful moral vision that survived throughout his whole life. He never lost his humanist and moral vision of life. Uh, third, he had a compassion for people and a trust for ordinary men and women. And this compassion and trust survived his exposure to the most horrific Nazi and Stalinist crimes. And finally, he had a remarkable and beautiful prose style. Reading his short stories, you are reading a couple of his short stories today, um, reading his novels is a very powerful experience. Probably the most important feature of Grossman's work, in my opinion, is his honesty, his willingness to try to speak the truth, even under very difficult and dangerous circumstances. Speaking the truth in Stalin's Soviet Union was difficult, dangerous, and deadly. And yet Grossman never became a hack of the Stalinist state. His novel, Life and Fate, really his life's work, though he wrote many other novels, gives a truthful account of some of the most fundamental evils of Stalinist dictatorship in its conduct of the war and its conduct of revolution. 
He wrote about the Holodomor, the starvation of the Ukrainian peasants, the war of starvation against the Ukraine. The important essay, the really crucially important essay, Ukraine Without Jews, was one of the very first major exposures of people in Europe and people around the world um, of the Holocaust, of the destruction of a whole people. It was written in 1943, shortly after the Red Army liberated Eastern Ukraine. It was rejected for publication by Grossman's newspaper, The Red Star, because of Soviet avoidance of highlighting Jewish victims of Nazi aggression. This is itself an expression of anti-Semitism. It was published fairly shortly thereafter in Yiddish, in Unity, which was the newspaper of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. Grossman's mother had already been murdered in the extermination of the Jews of Berdachev in 1941. And Grossman had a very deep sense of guilt and sorrow uh, about the murder of his mother. I've got a couple of long quotes here. I'm not gonna include them in this lecture, but please read them. They're, they're very important quotes and very powerful quotes. This one I will read at least the first half of it. Stillness, silence, a people has been murdered. Murdered are elderly artisans, well-known masters of trades, tailors, hat makers, shoemakers, tinsmiths, jewelers, house painters, furriers, bookbinders, Murdered are workers, porters, mechanics, electricians, carpenters, furnace workers, locksmiths. Murdered are wagon drivers, tractor drivers, chauffeurs, cabinet makers. Murdered are millers, bakers, pastry chefs, cooks. Murdered are doctors, therapists, dentists, surgeons, gynecologists. Murdered are experts in bacteriology and biochemistry, directors of university clinics, teachers of history, algebra, trigonometry. Murdered are lecturers, department assistants, candidates, and doctors of science. Murdered are engineers, metallurgists, bridge builders, architects, shipbuilders. Murdered are pavers, agronomists, field crop growers, land surveyors. Murdered are accountants, bookkeepers, store merchants, suppliers, managers, secretaries, night guards. Murdered are teachers, dressmakers, murdered our grandmothers who could mend stockings and bake delicious bread. All are murdered, many hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And this quote also is important. If, if you remember nothing from Ukraine without Jews, this passage is the thing to remember. This is not the death of individuals at war who had weapons in their hands and had left behind their home, family, fields, songs, books, customs, and folk tales. This is the murder of a people, the murder of homes, entire families, books, faith, the murder of the tree of life. This is the death of roots and not the branches or leaves. It is the murder of a people's body and soul, the murder of life that to toiled for generations to create thousands of intelligent, talented artisans and intellectuals. This is the murder of a people's morals, customs, and anecdotes passed from fathers to sons. This is the murder of memories, sad songs, and epic tales of good and bad times. It is the destruction of family homes and of burial grounds. This is the death of a people who had lived beside Ukrainian people for centuries, laboring, sinning, performing acts of kindness, and dying alongside them on one and the same earth. Finally, I traveled and walked this land from the Northern Donuts to the Dnieper, from the Voroshilograd to the Donbass, to Chernogov in the Desna. I have walked along the Dnieper and looked out at Kiev. And during all this time, I met one single Jew. The Jews of Ukraine are no more. He also has this important observation, and I think this captures his social philosophy, his, his moral philosophy as a man. How is this murder different from the hundreds and thousands of people that the Germans executed elsewhere in fascist occupied Europe? There is a difference, and it lies in the fact that the fascists 
execute French, Dutch, Serbian, Ukrainian, Russian, and Czech people for violating fascist rules and laws, hiding a switchblade or an old revolver, accidentally uttering an angry word, a young man refusing to abandon his elderly parents for a German labor camp, or offering a sip of water to a partisan. But the Germans execute the Jews only because of the fact that they are Jews. In their view, Jews have no right to be alive. And here is what I would refer to as Grossman's credo, his humanism. In our times, the equality of all people constitutes the highest moral principle of humanity. Racism is the exact opposite of this principle. People will ask me, are the Germans a nation of murderers and criminals then? No, for we believe in the great principle of equality of the world's peoples. We know that the German people have not only produced Hitler, Goebbels, Goering, and Rosenberg, not just the Hohenzollern and Krupp dynasties, not only the Stenz and Guderian, Ley and Ribbentrop, Horst Wessel and Nietzsche. This is the same people who produced Kant, Goethe, Hegel, Feuerbach, Marx, Engels, and the great martyr Liebknecht. It produced the enlightened wisdom and pure soul of Auguste Babel and has borne thousands of proletarian fighters, hundreds of humane and modest social and scholarly activists, and many kind women and sincere old workers. Here's an appreciation of Grossmann by Irving Howe, the American writer, very distinguished writer, um, a socialist much of his life, but a man of letters. And he's commenting on the novel late in Grossmann's life, Forever Flowing. Reading the pages of Forever Flowing with their glow of humane reflectiveness, one wonders, how did people like Grossmann hack their way out of the ideological jungle in which circumstances had trapped them? How in their enforced isolation did they find a path and by no means uncritically to the best of Western thought? Whatever the answers, one is almost tempted after reading this book to accept Grossmann's view, a view not exactly encouraged by recent history, that there is a quote, natural indestructible striving toward freedom inherent in human nature. It's a beautiful passage and summary of the philosophy of Grossmann. So let's now talk just a little more briefly about anti-Semitism in Hitler and in Germany's policies. Hitler's anti-Semitism expressed in Mein Kampf and expressed in his, his um, tyrannical rule in Germany is really exceptional. It is different from anti-Semitism in other parts of Europe and different from other kinds of racism. It's different from more ordinary intolerance, bigotry, prejudice, and racism. His anti-Semitism involved a profound hatred for a whole people and a determination to exterminate this people. Hitler's anti-Semitism became interwoven with his Aryanism, his Lebensraum theory, and his overall war goals. Extermination of the Jews of Europe was a primary war goal and was enacted almost as soon as Nazi forces defeated Poland and invaded the Soviet territories of Ukraine, the Baltic states, and marched towards Moscow. But what about the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union was governed by ideology and brutality. And ideology was conveyed by a propaganda machine, a state propaganda machine, which brooked no dissidence or as little dissidence as was humanly possible. Stalin and his propaganda machine downplayed the Jewish identities of Hitler's program of extermination because the Soviet Union preferred to describe the victims of Nazi aggression and violence as innocent Soviet citizens. Eventually, Stalin's propaganda machine saw value in making a case to Jews in the United States and other Western countries in support of the United Front against Hitler and the entry of the US into the war and therefore began speaking of uh, atrocities against Jewish communities. But their preference and Stalin's preference was to give no recognition whatsoever to the Jewish victims of Nazi violence. And that kind of explains the absence of any notice, any uh, recognition, any commemoration of Babi Yar in Kiev. What was the Jewish anti-fascist committee 
The Jewish, the J JAC as it was called, was established with the support and blessing of the Soviet state. It drew leading figures from the Jewish intelligentsia, including writers and cultural workers, theater, dance, opera, etc. Much of its work was published in Yiddish to permit the widest readership in Europe's Jewish population. And it's really important to notice that JAC was a loyal, committed, and energetic supporter of Soviet communism and Soviet war aims. It was not a dissident organization, but it was devoted to uncovering the truth of the crimes against the Jews of Ukraine, the Jews of Lithuania, the Jews of Eastern Europe. The JAC had substantial impact through its publications and through its ability to uncover the barbarous campaign of extermination being carried out by the Nazi state in Eastern Europe, more or less as it happened. Writers attached to the Red Army, including Grossland, had remarkably complete access to the details of extermination and violence that had been carried out by the Nazis, uncovered as the Red Army regained territory recently occupied by the, by the Germans. In the article on Treblinka, which we've referred to before, Treblinka as hell is an excellent example. Uh, it was written also under the, uh, or eventually it was published under the banner of the JAC. The biggest um, contribution of the JAC was uh, what is called the Black Book, with the subtitle The Ruthless Murder of Jews by German Fascist Invaders throughout the temporarily occupied regions of the Soviet Union and in the death camps of Poland during the war of 1941-1945. This is a tremendously important document and it is available to you both as a link in this week's um, module and as a file in the Canvas tab. Under the editorship of Ilya Ehrenberg and Vasily Grossman, it is a compendium of articles, documents, and firsthand reports of the report of the murder and cruelty exercised by German forces against the Jewish populations of the territories of the Soviet Union, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, and so forth. Several of Grossman's articles are included, including the murder of the Jews of Berdichev and the hell of Treblinka. And this is one of the most important contemporaneous efforts to collect information about the extermination campaign against the Jews of Eastern Europe that existed in the 1940s. Publication though, was suppressed by the Soviet authorities after the end of World War II. What about Stalin? It is entirely fair, it is not an editorial comment to say that Stalin was a moral monster. The terror of the 1930s, personally inspired and ordered by Stalin, the execution of tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people whom Stalin did not trust as a group. The, the show trials of the leaders of his own Bolshevik party, his own communist party, the execution of tens of thousands of innocent people and the establishment of the prison camps now known as the Gulag. These represent some of the evils of the 20th century that we've been discussing. During and after World War II, Stalin's mistrust of Jewish in individuals and the Jewish people, uh, his mistrust, his, dis his um, belief that they were disloyal to the USSR, that they were bourgeois, they were traitors, they were involved in conspiracies with American intelligence or conspiracies to sabotage Soviet progress. These were crazy lies that Stalin accepted and promulgated. And they took murderous form in official repression and persecution, both of leading Jews and of the whole population of Soviet Jews. Stalin's repression of the Jews after the war was severe. Like the purges of the 1930s, these purges involved manufactured evidence, confessions obtained through torture, and the executions of the accused. The trials were held in secret, this is the meaning of the book title that um, I, I've asked you to read a review of, Stalin's Secret Pogrom, The Post-War Inquisition of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And this is basically the um, secret archive of the investigation that Stalin ordered of the uh, Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, leading to the execution of almost all of the leaders of JAC, including 13 out of 15 people who were accused. 
in um, what is, a, I think, a very uh, important book about Stalinism, Joshua Rubenstein's book, um, The Last Days of Stalin. Uh, there, there's a chapter which um, go, walks through the very deliberate actions taken by the Soviet state under Stalin's command to attack the Jews. Party propaganda became more and more vicious in campaigns against Jews in the Soviet Union. Quoting from him, Stalin's regime disbanded the JAC, claiming that it was, quote, a, cent a center of anti-Soviet propaganda and regularly submits anti-Soviet information to organs of foreign intelligence, a ridiculous lie. Stalin's campaign became even more direct and violent in the 1950s against Jewish professionals and intellectuals. And in the doctor's plot, again, I won't read this quote, but in the doctor's plot, um, again, manufactured simply based on lies, um, a major effort to implicate a whole people, the Jewish people, in a ridiculous claim of a conspiracy to murder um, the top leadership of the Soviet Union. There is also a persistent rumor, there was a persistent rumor, that Stalin intended to deport whole populations of Soviet Jews to remote locations in the Soviet Union. Other ethnic groups had in fact suffered deportation in the 1940s, the Tatars, the Ingush, the Balkan, Balkars, the Karashevsky and the Kalmyks. Um, these are all different ethnic peoples who were relocated across the Urals. However, Rubenstein is not completely persuaded that there is documentary evidence surviving that would support the idea that there was a plan to deport two and a half million Soviet Jews. However, Roy Medvedev, who is a distinguished Soviet scientist who went into exile uh, during the Stalin period, uh, he wrote in his book, Let History Judge, everything indicated that Stalin was beginning preparations for a mass deportation of Jews to remote districts. And there is certainly no doubt that Soviet Jews felt great hostility and antagonism in their daily lives, leading to a great deal of voluntary emigration to various countries, including Israel. So totalitarian power in the Soviet Union and fundamental hatred of the Jewish people in Germany and elsewhere led to the evils of the bloodlands. Hitler's Nazi state was ideologically and practically committed to destroying the Jews of Europe completely. Stalin's paranoia and his total grasp of power of the Soviet state and the NKVD, the secret police, permitted him to commit great atrocities against his own citizens, including the Holodomor, the purges, the relocations, the Gulag, and the anti-Semitic campaigns from 1945-46 forward. I'll just remind you, this is a, a map which I thought would be useful for us um, throughout the course, but I'll post it for you again. Um, the distribution of Jews in Europe in 1933, where there were about nine and a half million Jews and six million of these Jews were killed in the final solution. So thank you, I look forward to discussing these, um, these texts next week. <laughs>